All right, you happily miserable accursed. Time for the curse of politics. Your favorite expletive and full fucking flower political pod. I'm David Hurley with two thirds of our political panel. Corey Tanike is with me. Jordan Leichnitz is with me. But Scott Reed is not. We're readless today. He's dumped the podcast for the sirens call of some big time terrestrial radio gig. But he'll be back next week, and thank God for that, because a readless pod is a little like a rumless Coke. Delicious, but where's the addictive mania and vitriol? Jordan, you'll have to fill that in today. All right, here's the show today. I just had a great conversation with pollsters Dan Arnold and David Coletto for the Hurley Burley this week. It was about the Conservatives now holding a 10-point lead over the Liberals, breaking a years-long logjam of neck-and-neck -neck numbers. Corey, Jordan, and I are going to talk about that convo, so this issue of the curse becomes a bit of a companion piece to the Hurley Burley, which we'll put out tomorrow. Our curse clipping takes us west. It's from Kelly Kreiderman writing in The Globe about Rob Anderson, Premier Smith's key lieutenant and driver of Alberta's Sovereignty Act. And in the wake of Katie Telford's quote tweet of a Guardian article about Canada having zero pro-choice conservative MPs, we'll discuss wedge issues, how you use them, and when you can burn them out. And after that, Mr. Pinson tees up our hey use. Jordan, Corey, how are you after the long weekend? Corey, you're high as a kite. <laughs> yeah, I, I have a herniated disc, uh, and I'm on my honeymoon, so the jokes write themselves as to how that happened. But uh, <laughs> in any event, I'm I'm here nonetheless, uh, although uh, not not at a hundred percent. <laughs> I was going to say, don't lie, Corey. You're at that age where rolling over in bed the wrong way will give yeah. you a herniated mm. disc. <laughs> oh, Jesus. Well, once you hit 40, you start getting sleep related injuries. It's like you wake up in the morning. And you just, it's not like you played a bad game of tennis or something. It's no, you just slept incorrectly. Yeah. You you had a long weekend? Good long weekend, Jordan? I understand you I were did. out camping again. No, no, not camping. There were walls oh. involved this time, cottaging. Uh, it was really great. We had great weather. The lake was warm. The beer was cold. It was like, you know, that peak summer August weekend experience. So it was excellent. Um, excellent. Yes, would exactly recommend. Right. Chilly nights, though. Chilly nights, yes. Yeah. Those of you camping, pack your hats, friends cold <laughs> <Yep>. <laughs> all right so well, yeah go ahead i was just gonna say it's 42 degrees celsius here in madrid so it's uh <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. And here. <laughs> not cooling down that much at night you're finding uh, yeah i know it cooled down to 27 last night so <laughs> <laughs> good sangria weather there you go. i hope you have air conditioning uh so as promised in the intro uh, I want us to springboard off a discussion I had with David Coletto and Dan Arnold uh, about the current polls, um, which I think are, is significant because we have gone from a consensus that the two parties were sort of locked in a death struggle set with two or three points separating them. And now we see some daylight. Now we see the Conservatives 338 says they've got an eight point lead on average. Some pollsters are showing at 10. Uh, so that's a big change. Uh, it's a big change in the likely outcome, a big change in what the seat outcome would be if the election happened. And it's more along the lines of what you'd expect to see uh, in a late term government than what we than what we had been seeing. You know, they may not like me summarizing it, but I thought their general posture was that the only thing standing between Polyev and victory are time and the possibility for change that that brings and Polyev himself. Um, their view is that a liberal victory requires him being rendered unacceptable to most voters uh, and that he's particularly susceptible to that. So let's hear them talk about that a little bit. And then let's watch Polyev's response because Polyev has a brand new ad out today and it's come, um, they are promoting this as saying it's part of a $3 million campaign there are several pieces of creative it's going on television it's going digital it's going radio so people are going to see this um i think it's very very interesting that they've come out with this before the liberals came out with their attempt to frame him uh so a lot of a lot of food uh for uh, discussion there but let's start with a little video clip you know the liberals will have to hit him pretty hard because um yeah, as you said, it's hard to win a fourth mandate unless people are disqualifying the opposition. And so do you think you'd go after him? 
David, do you think you'd go after him on policy grounds or on character grounds? Like he hangs around with weird people and you can't trust uh, what he says about this, the issue or that issue, or would you go after him? He's going to cancel the CPP. He's going to uh, undo dental care, whatever these kinds of things. Is it, is he more vulnerable as a wing nut or as a conservative? I think, I think you go after both. I think you can, I think, you know, I actually think the convoy is, 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 you know, fruitful ground to, to, to remind people that this was somebody who was out there taking pictures with, with people that only 20% of the Canadians, you know, empath empathize with or, or agreed with. Like, this is the vast majority, including half of conservatives who said, I don't like any of those people. I don't think they're doing the right thing, but I, but I think it, it, it sticks by making him feel reckless right that that he's doing it for the wrong reasons that it's simply vengeance or this was you know he's got this grand vision of of a conservative uh you know as he likes to say free the freest country in the world well what what does that mean it means as dan said cuts to cpp it means cuts to health care he he wants to get inflation under control he says by cutting and cutting and cutting well what, well, what is he going to cut what do you need to do to make the next election about something big that you can have a debate about that's not piddling around? And cost of living is a big issue, but it's something you can't really solve. You can't have a real debate around the cost of living, but you can find another issue to do it. So I do think that's what they've got to find. They've got to find um, something that 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 creates a sharp, clear, big divide between the conservatives. Climate change could be the issue, by the way. Like it's rising as a as a concern about. Um, and if, if this extreme weather events continue to happen in all parts of the country, um, it could be that issue where the, you know, the conservatives are incredibly vulnerable on that issue. Um, so so I, I agree, David, that they have to probably be better on the economy, but I don't think they're going to find any chance of turning that around. So they need to find something else to fight about. I've been paying a little more attention to immigration. Um, I think that's a sleeper issue that the conservatives maybe recognizing the opportunity there that that it connects to housing it connects to cost of living it connects to health care and i think you know anyone listening or watching this podcast who thinks that you know the the elite consensus on immigration canada is, is something that we will never see broken i think they're wrong because the public opinion data that i'm seeing suggests people are not turning to xenophobia but they are worried that we're letting too many people in and it's having a big effect on the things they count, count on. And if Paul Yev was to say, we are going to cut that half million in half, people wouldn't say he was xenophobic for doing that, right? That would be seen as a reasonable thing to do given the pressures on the system Absolutely. right now. That's what I just, I just released some data on my sub stack that that's found exact that response. Yeah. Dan. Yeah. I mean, I think on that point, I think it just shows that, you know, Two years is a long time in politics. Um, two years ago, we were talking about COVID. Two years before that, environment was a big issue. Two years before that, Trump was a big issue. Maybe it will be immigration, maybe climate change, you know, maybe something else. And I think, um, you know, for for liberals who are feeling uh, despondent at the current polls, I mean, Yama yeah, Ginty, Christy Clark went through this as well on route to their final victories. Um, you know, things can change quickly, right? And Polyev is not defined yet. So I think how Polyev gets the find and how the back half of this mandate go, um, you know, could change things quite quickly. Uh, and, um, you know, just because it's 10 points today, I mean, it could be worse in, in two years. That's certainly a possibility too. Um, but I wouldn't say the next election is a foregone conclusion that Polyev is going to win at this point, uh, given that he is an untested leader. So, I mean, the, you know, I, Dan Arnold was trying to put a little bit more air in the tires of the Liberals than David Coletto was, but they both came to pretty much the same place. Road to re-election is going to be really, really difficult for the Liberals, and uh, they need to hope for a change in the issue set, and they need to go after Polyev hard. Uh, first of all, let's just take one round. I think we all agree on this, by the way, don't we? We've talked about it before. Jordan, what's your take? Yeah, I, I mean, I, I think we've talked about this uh, as many times as there has been shows about the need for the liberals to go after Polyev and define him in a muscular way, which they, for for whatever reason, have elected not to do. And so now the inevitable is happening, which uh, that time has not been the friend of the liberals. And I think it's particularly interesting that this summer seems to have been damaging to their overall horse race numbers 
in a, in a fairly sustained way. And this kind of tracks what we have talked about in weeks previous, that the, the affordability crisis and the economic issues facing people are actually worsening. They are deepening as we head into the fall. And so on the one hand, you have the prime minister out there talking about our standing relative to the G8 and how great we're doing by international comparators, but what people are feeling and seeing in their day-to-day lives is actually worse than it was in the spring. And so those tracks are diverging, I think, in a way that is particularly damaging for uh, for the prime minister. And the conservatives, on the other hand, have had a lot of runway over the last year for to define Polyev. And I think, rightly, um, some some of the issues that we've discussed around the need to soften his image and to create a bit of a kinder, gentler version of Polyev has obviously um, resulted in the ad that they've put out today. And that is just so squarely targeted at female voters um, who are looking for that that kinder side of the conservative leader. So, I mean, they are looking at the data and I think making some rational decisions, not in everything, but certainly in, in this case. And the real question for me is why the Liberals have allowed this time to elapse without mounting a credible attack to define Polyev um, and, and instead have really allowed him the space to make those mistakes, to try out different things, and now to, to put forward something that's really backed by, uh, by research that is probably going to be pretty effective. Who is Pierre Polyev? Many know him as the common sense leader the country needs. His school teacher parents know him as the boy they adopted and raised in their modest home in the suburbs of Calgary. His dad knows him as the son he took to early morning hockey games. His neighbors know him as the boy who used to deliver the morning newspaper. His children know him in Francais, Espanol, and English as Papa. And I know him as a guy who loves me for who I am, a Canadian who came to call Canada home, and his wife. So when Pierre says, it doesn't matter who you know or where you're from, but rather who you are and where you're going. These aren't just empty words. He's lived it. Common sense. Let's bring it home. Yeah, Corey, I mean, this ad is exactly what I would have done. I think it's beautiful. Yeah. I think it's really yeah. good. Yeah, I think it's smart in a lot of ways. I think it's uh, smart, the fact that it, the voiceover is his wife. Like, I think that's smart. Uh, it's a it's a, a subtle way of bringing her into the conversation, and I, as we've talked about many times before, I think uh, the speech that she gave after he won the leadership is among the the, the best endorsements that you could ever hope to have in terms of its uh, effectiveness. Um, so yeah, I thought I, I thought the the clip was was interesting. I also think it's it's quite interesting that. They both have basically given up on on the liberals having uh, the ability to win on the economy, and um, uh, th- that's almost admitting total defeat in my mind. And when you look at the the top, you know, four or five issues week after week, whenever we see a poll, what's at the top? It's all of those issues. So uh, it's not only you know a third term seeking uh, you know seeking another term when when most people ne- can never get it, uh, but. You also have to do that where your party is is well behind on you know the top issues that people are talking about. Uh, I think they're they're probably correct to point out that uh, uh, that climate change is is the one area you know one area where where it's going up uh, due to the wildfires and extreme temperatures. Uh, many other places uh, that that might be one avenue that could go down, but I think that one can be judo moved on you as well because it's so. Uh, inextricably tied to the carbon tax, uh, which is putting additional pressure on things like gasoline and groceries. So, you know, it's it's a you know I think it was a pretty uh, damning indictment of the liberals and their ch- and their chances of reelection. Yeah, I just don't think you can win if people think you're bad at the economy, and you know they can think that you might not be as good as somebody, but if they really think you're inadequate at it are going to fuck it up. I mean, that's been a huge advantage the Liberals have had over the NDP over the years is some comfort level with economic management, right? Yeah, and I think if you are the Liberals and you're looking for a silver lining in that conversation, there weren't many of them because I think the the notion that uh, some you know something could happen in the next year and a half is going like that is a bit of a a bit of a hail mary. But 
I think one of the things that um, that David Cletto was talking about is that when we look at the numbers, it's it's not necessarily so much that there's a strong pro Pierre Polyev conservative vote out there beyond his base. It's more that there's just really deep unhappiness with the liberals. And this is part of like Trudeau's personal growing negatives and some of the right track, wrong track numbers that we've seen really um, diverging a lot over the last year. And so, you know, that kind of comes back, comes back to something we've talked about before, which is the idea that people are unhappy with Trudeau, but they're not super happy with the alternatives either. And so the notion that in a time of economic uncertainty where people are feeling personally very insecure, maybe they are not going to want to gamble. Maybe they're not going to want to gamble with a conservative leader who might be on the fringe, who might be too extreme, who might be out there consorting with the wackos instead of really being concerned about their issues. So there is still a bit of a soft underbelly, I think, for, for Paul Yev. I don't want to overstate um, you know, the, uh, the tight t-shirt, uh, no glasses. Um, but this and, ad, you, yeah. this ad is going to be effective at softening up th some of those. Well, and I think actually spots. this ad is probably going to be far more effective than some of the other rebranding stuff that we've seen over the last few weeks. And, and the reason for it is Polly of himself doesn't speak in it, right? He has <laughs> no voice in it. It's, and, and I mean, I'm not joking about that because I think, I think yeah. that actually it presents, you are you are seeing him through his his wife's eyes, right? And that yeah. is exactly the image they want to project to female voters who they want to be able to feel safe with this guy. So that's mm -hmm. why I think it could be really powerful and effective. And uh, that's also why I'm I'm just continue to be astounded that the liberals have mounted no real effort to prevent such an effective. Uh, argument from being put forward uh, and no, you know, no obvious counterattack. Yeah. You got I mean, uh, to think they don't have money. It's like, that's only got to be the only I reason, can, right? That's yeah, the only thing pay, I can pay, think of. Pay now or pay later, right? Like, and, and I think that, you know, doing this stuff in the pre-writ, the last few cycles have really shown that that is an important investment um, that people, even if they are not fully tuning into politics right now for a whole variety of reasons, they are aware of the personalities and they are aware in a background sense of some of the things that are happening and they are making decisions about who they would rule in and rule out as potential places for their vote. And so that's why I think that this period is is just so crucial, and especially uh, in a time where we don't know how long this government is going to last, right? So, of course, the agreement in technicality with the NDP goes to 2025. But as we've talked about before, there's a lot of scenarios in which that plug gets pulled real early next year, maybe. Um, so there's just not a whole lot of runway there necessarily. Although I have to say, Jordan, that those two guys did not see anything in the data that led them to believe the NDP should be wanting an election. Yeah, I agree with that. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And yeah. and they, they, they actually saw real possibility that the NDP vote could move in two directions, that Polyev's offensive against working class NDP voters in mill towns in B.C. and in northern Ontario, et cetera, could be quite successful, and that if it looked like Polyev might win, in they, they could get squeezed on the progressive side of their vote to the Liberals to help stop. So there is a there there is a looming problem, positioning problem for the NDP coming up too. Yeah, on that I would say the second one, of course, the the loss of of soft support to the Liberals, like that is a dynamic the New Democrats face every re-election. That is a, right. a very familiar, like two weeks out to E-Day bleed that um, that every New Democrat operative has seen a million times over. And I think that that is one that that Singh's campaign is going to have to to bake in happening from the get go and, and look for some ways to staunch that. I think on the on the question of of NDP CPC switchers in those key ridings, like I agree, you know, they exist for sure, but I, I think we have to be careful not to overstate it. Like when you look at where, and the, you know, even if you look at Coletto's own numbers about where the current support for conservatives are coming from. So like 75% of it obviously is from previous conservative voters, but only 4% are previous new Democrat voters. So in some of those writings, it's actually going to matter a lot more what liberal supporters do, whether they choose to stay home, whether they end up voting NDP, like that could actually right, be right. a lot, a lot more influential. Liberals could get squeezed in those areas. That's right. Think, that's know? right. I think that's far more likely. Well, the, the way conservatives win 
you know, majority government, if you were to go back to 2011, it's, it's, you got to have very good splits and, and to have good splits, you need the NDP to have some, some bench strength in, uh, in some critical areas. Like they have to be strong in the lower mainland. They have to be strong in the 905. And if they're not, then, you know, those races become very tight and it's sort of a coin toss between the liberals and the conservatives who will win. So I, I, th- I think, if I were Trudeau, I'd be as worried about the the you know the numbers that Jagmeet is pulling down uh, as much as I would anything that Polyev's doing. Like I think there's a, a you know a weak NDP is not necessarily good for the Liberals. Yeah, it depends who they're weak to. Obviously, yeah. And, where, and again, where those, I think we where those like, are shifting. To be real, like right now, weak NDP North- very very good for the Liberals in the '90s. Extremely good for the Liberals in the '90s. Well, and but even now it could be good in in some seats. Like you know, a weak NDP could be good for them in you know Hamilton or Windsor or places like that where they've had success in the past. But uh, I think it's it's you know it's it's uh, if the NDP are doing uh, very well in the nine hundred five, you're going to see splits that are probably going to elect more conservatives, like as we saw in twenty eleven. I think we also have to acknowledge that the you know the NDP may not be that weak by the time we come around to the election. They're holding around 20% uh, you know, this spring and into the summer, and, and that's an improvement uh, over what they saw late last year. So we'll see where the trajectory goes on that. And I think that because of the role that they're playing in the confidence and supply agreement, they, they're they obviously aware and they're not going to go until they're in a favorable position, whether that's right. financially or electorally. So if you're like me, You've had an EV on your mind for quite some time. I know it's good for the environment, so the next car I buy is an electric vehicle, you say. Or you hedge your bets with, or maybe the one after that. Because until the charging infrastructure is in place, you just can't commit. Well, our presenting sponsor, TELUS, is taking a lead role in helping that along. We've talked about it here, oh, I don't know, about 60 or 70 times now. TELUS operates with a laser-like focus on social purpose. They believe that doing good for people is good business, and they have a long track record of backing up that belief with investment dollars to help solve some of our most pressing challenges. Here's one of those challenges. With millions of electric vehicles predicted to be on Canadian roads in the next number of years, we need about 200,000 public chargers to be installed by 2030. So TELUS has just announced a strategic partnership with an Australian EV charging company called Jolt, because what else would they call it, eh? To install up to 5,000 fast chargers across Canada running on the TELUS network. It's kind of a perfect marriage because these are two companies with shared values. Jolt's been working to grow EV usage around the globe with their 100% renewable energy powered technology. And TELUS is a world leader in environmental sustainability and using technology to bring a greener future. More accessible, affordable EV charging across Canada will commence almost immediately. Later this year, Jolt and TELUS begin installing their network of EV charging stations, which will include TELUS' public Wi-Fi capability. Across the network, all EV drivers will just tap their Jolt app to access 7 kilowatt hours of free charging per day, which equates to 40 to 50 kilometers of range depending on the vehicle. You might say TELUS and Jolt are committed to a greener Canada via electric vehicles in a way that costs us a little less green. You can find out more about it all at TELUS.com. So, you know, we don't have Scott here to bully us this week, so we can have our own (laughs) opinion about this. And, you know, uh, David Coletto suggested in the podcast that Trudeau's numbers are now bad enough that the conventional wisdom that he is the best choice for the liberals may be wrong and that he's so far underwater on favorables. Now there's been a 20 point shift in his favorable since the last election, right? Uh, that the liberals may want to consider uh, or Trudeau may want to consider that the liberals should be led by somebody else. Um, and uh Dan Arnold, the former liberal pollster, did not come at him with fireballs uh, when he said that. What do you think? What do I think? Well, I think it's all about Quebec. Uh, You know, if it's if if it's not Trudeau, who is it like Jolie? I think 
she could do very well in Quebec if you're looking at that Leger pool that we like to talk about, uh, about which you know uh, politicians have game in Quebec. Um, you know, there are people who do have some who are in the liberal family, uh, but do they have any game in English Canada? Uh, how are they going to go over in the, in, in the 905? And, you know, how are they going to go over in BC? So, like, I think, you know, if, if I were uh, to pretend I'm Scott for a minute, I think he'd be, we'd probably be saying some version of the same thing. Uh, Trudeau has a, a um, unnatural for a liberal appeal in British Columbia. He is well known and uh, better and better liked there than uh, you know probably anyone until you know, until you go back to John Turner for for uh, for people who are in a you know in the leadership position. Um, and he also does all right in Quebec. And you know and he's the numbers aren't terrible in Ontario for him everywhere. I, uh, so, you know, I, I fail to see the politician who's going to come in and, and be able to do those things. That said, you know, if, if I were Polyev, I'd want Trudeau to stay. Like, I think he's their biggest liability right now. And so, I, you know, the, they've scored a lot of, you know, pretty heavy punches on him over the last year and a half. And uh, it'd be a shame to have those all go to waste and you have to go and try to, to blemish some new candidate. Jordan, Corey's argument is kind of like the argument for Biden running, which is, yeah. well, who'd be better? Can you think of yeah. anybody right now who'd be better at that? And But, you know, you don't know that until you have a race, right? Yeah, I mean, it's the two sides of the same coin, right? Like, I think Trudeau is always going to look weak next to a hypothetical perfect leader that doesn't exist, right? And And so I think we have to be careful when we're having this discussion that that's not who he is being held up against. Uh, each potential replacement brings their own baggage and their own weaknesses to the table that they would have to also be weighed in the mix compared to Trudeau's personal negatives. And, and I think when you look at that calculation, I agree with Scott that the question of Quebec is a huge one. And I don't see anybody in the field who tallies up necessarily above Trudeau, even with his own weaknesses. But that said, it's clear, look, the next campaign, obviously, this is going to be a change election. And so the question the liberals have yet to answer is how are they going to present a face of change uh, relative to themselves with Trudeau as leader? If well, let, me stick, Canadians- let me stick with you there on that, yeah. because the, the, the pollsters said something that I thought was a little bit of a hook for the liberals. They said that Trudeau had a massive advantage over Polyev on compassion, on being a compassionate person. Uh, now, maybe this ad campaign by the Conservatives will close that gap a, l- a little bit, but let's assume that gap exists. In this economically difficult time, how can the Liberals use that? I think they'll use it the way <clears throat> the way they always try to use it, which leads into some of our other topics, which is to take a or multiple wedge issues, throw them all at the wall, and see which one chops up the electric electorate in a way that's favorable to them, whether it's abortion uh, or guns, or even if they're going to make an attempt on climate. Although I do agree with Corey on that. I think the blowback on it could make that um, fairly useless, but we saw it in the last campaign on vaccines. So, you know, they will choose an issue that they feel um, drives Polyev into a more extreme place and, and they'll hammer home on it. And, and I think, does that make the most of the, Trudeau's advantage on compassion, I'm not sure. But I, I also I also think that that is already baked in for people who are considering voting liberal. I think that if that is the the type of leadership that you're looking for and 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 that matters to you, then then your options are Trudeau or Singh, right? If that's if that's the style of leadership you're looking for. And and I don't think that what we've seen in the rebranding for Polyev so far suggests to me that they are going to be leaning into a competition for compassion. They're leaning into some other things, you know, around competence, around a sort of strong father figure, all of those things. But it he's never going to come out on top and a head to head on that. But but again, for voters for whom, for women in particular, uh, I think that that's already a baked in thing. I was wondering if it presented a way back into the economic discussion somehow for the liberals. If the, if that compassion edge allowed for a different kind of economic message that maybe sounded resonant with people. Do you see mm-hmm. anything possible mm-hmm. there, Corey? 
I think it's I think it's tough to imagine them finding something like this is sort of back to our last conversation about the cabinet. Just because I don't think they can win if they have yeah. no voice in the economy. Yeah, so I think they've I, got it. I agree, but I, I'm, I'll throw. Some, uh, you know, I'm not trying to avoid your question here, but I, I think, uh, I think that what's interesting, or uh, you know, an interesting play. I'm not saying they're going to do this, but I wonder if, uh, if Trudeau ran saying this is my last election, I'm not running again, and basically promised to go away. If that wouldn't be better for them in some instances, then then not like. Uh, I think that there's a fatigue with with Trudeau more than there is a fatigue with. The Did Liberal he say it Party. at the beginning or with three days left? Uh, <laughs> well, I think I think I do it at the beginning. But as, as, as you already know, as save you, us as all the know, grief. Uh, but like he he is a liability more than more than the Liberals are. I think, and uh, you know, it's uh, you know, I don't know how they come back if they continue down the path that they're on, which is where he's the attack dog and, and having, you know, either Trudeau or Paulia being the attack dog undermines their ability to be liked by people. But I think it's particularly bad for Trudeau because it's so far from what his original brand was, which was sunny ways and the guy who's not going to do any of that stuff. So, you know, now he's got all of the, you know, the unappealingness of that approach uh, stacked on with you're just another fucking lion politician. And Maybe increasingly, by the way, the negative is coming out of his mouth. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Right? And I um, to come back which to is so, quickly. so weird to me that, you know, to go back to the no advertising, but you make the leader carry the attacks. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And I, that worse than anything that it seems indisciplined to me. Like, I'm not sure that it's planned, which is, which is even worse. <laughs> um, but, but just to go back to your question, David, I think, one of the things, you know, in terms of empathy and the economic argument, you know, the Liberals have tested that a little bit, right? We've seen in the last year, and particularly post-COVID, as they moved off their middle class messaging onto the sort of we've got your back messaging, which I would argue is maybe a little bit more um, yep. kind of an emotional um, economic argument. And and I think um, I think that, it, you know, it, it tests fairly well, but but the problem is, is that a lot of the economic arguments that Polyev is making test better, right? So around lower taxes, around powerful paychecks and things like that, that those, even, even though people like the emotionally resonant economic argument, they like even better uh, the things that feel uh, more tangible to them. And so I think that that is the challenge is how do you, how do you bridge that strength of empathy and connection with real stuff for people like that. And and I think, you know, you see, you certainly see Singh trying to walk that path, right? So he's got the empathy and he's trying to, he's trying to then also grab those tangible things. And I think that's yeah. the challenge for the prime minister is, is, can he do that? Okay. Do you have something to say, Corey? Uh, I was just going to say, it's not, it's not going to be a $500 check uh, for groceries. Like it, it's, it's not going to be, you know, it can't be all this, these little niche pissant things or, you know, dental care program that, uh, you know, benefits almost no one. So like, I, I think they, they have to find something that's a little bit grander and a little bit larger if they, if they want to have it uh, actually score points. And I think they've ruled out some of the obvious things uh, and left them on the table for, uh, uh, for Polyev, like you know, a pause on the on on the carbon tax is something that every premier in Canada has asked for. But you know, they're never going to do that. Trudeau's never going to do that. But Polyev can can make that commitment no problem, and and so he does have a grand thing that he wants to do in that area. Corey, if I was in the if I was in the Liberal campaign, faced with that conundrum, and I posed this to the pollster guys when I talked, to them, is I would be worried. I'd really want to be reassured that people were going to see a pause in the carbon tax as a responsive thing by a government that was in touch with what regular people were going through and decided to give them a break Mm -hmm. as opposed to an incredibly craven hypocritical act uh, by a dying government uh, desperate to save itself going back on its biggest principle. It could go either way. It could either put you back in contention or the slats could fall right out from under you if you do something like that. Well, I think I think it's probably the slats fall out uh, from under you because it's such uh, such a, a core part of what this government is. But, you know, it is one of the obvious policy mecha- mechanisms. You know, maybe it's not that you pause it. Maybe it's that you give all the money back in terms of checks for a period of time. 
Uh, so the carbon tax is still there, but you're getting a full refund. You know, but as as Gubo is uh, uh, admitted, it's it's not revenue neutral right now, and and it's punishing some people and uh, and benefiting some others. Yeah, I think the problem with 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 doing what you suggested, David, is that it like you see the point, right? You see the point that the carbon tax is an affordability problem. The minute you do that, um, then you know there. Like it's a linchpin, of course, of the overall climate plan. And so you you start to pull that out and the whole thing risks unraveling. So I think that the liberals have made choices that have painted themselves into a corner on that. And even yeah. though if you look at the numbers right now, the carbon tax is actually a, a relatively small driver of overall emissions reductions, that it doesn't matter, right? Because it's it's all bound up together in one in one thing for, for a lot of it. Right. Right. Carbon tax. Carbon tax is a, a religious belief. It's not a policy belief. I think for for some folks, especially in the government, like uh, well, the, the facts, the, the facts don't the, matter. It's the litmus test. And Dan Arnold yeah. said this: uh, they get a lot of elite endorsement of their mm-hmm. plan, largely because that's in there. It's right. uh, yeah, this is yeah, like it, of their own doing, though, to to have constructed it this way. That's the other. Irony. Yeah. So right about now. New federal ministers will be getting their mandate letters. Essentially, these directives are marching orders from the Prime Minister. They lay out what the minister is expected to achieve. Some leaders fight to keep mandate letters secret. Prime Minister Trudeau makes his public. They'll all be posted online, ready for inspection. Anyway, we now have a new Minister of Transport, and our sponsor, CN, would like to gently suggest a mandate letter for the Honourable Pablo Rodriguez. Here goes. First, Minister, when you contemplate issues in your portfolio, like the new supply chain office, railway safety, and partnering on labour policies, please, please take a fact-based approach, one driven by data. Supply chains are a continuum. To properly and smoothly function, all the parts have to collaborate and move in unison. So-called fixes, like extended interest switching, and we would be glad to discuss that, create negative unintended consequences. If all the supply chain players provide transparent data the way CN does, a reliable coordinated end-to-end system can be built. It would make maximum use of labor and assets, and it would improve safety. Canada's productivity is ailing, Minister. Requiring disclosure of data and then putting it to good use would be immensely helpful. Second, Minister, it remains impossible to load grain onto ships at the port of Vancouver when it's raining, and it rains a lot in Vancouver. Trains sit idle, ships sit unloaded, everything backs up, people get angry, and money is lost. Surely the Government of Canada, working with stakeholders, can solve this. If governments can work with the private sector to develop a COVID vaccine, we can figure out how to keep grain dry until it's in a ship's hold. Third, Minister, you are part of a government committed to green policies. CN is all in. Rail is already by far the most efficient form of land transport, but we need to go further. We need robust funding for research, development, and deployment of sustainable locomotive fuels and alternative propulsion technologies. CN has other ideas, but that's the gist for now. We stand ready to help. Welcome again, Minister. May the road rise to greet you. All right, we have a clipping today. And it's it's an interesting clipping because it was about somebody I never didn't know anything about. And it's a very compelling political story. It's Kelly Kreiderman in the Globe and Mail writing about a guy named Rob Anderson, who turns out to be a very significant advisor to Danielle Smith. And interesting story. So he was a PC MLA back in the day. He's sent to recruit her from Wild Rose to the PCs. She ends up convincing him to join the Wild Rose instead. And then he advises her, the two of them cook up this plot to to dissolve the Wild Rose and cross the floor to Jim Prentice's PCs, which destroys both of their careers uh, as it goes down. And and now now they're back. Um, And so it's a trajectory you don't often see in politics. And it's it's just a, an interesting article to have out there as a backstory to a political operative. Let me read a, a bit of this. The floor crossing set off a chain of events, including the shunning of Ms. Smith and Mr. Anderson by both Wild Rose and PC circles. He didn't think he would ever be part of politics again. And he and Ms. Smith didn't speak for many years. Quote, we both felt that we had let the other down in one way or another. 
The pandemic changed everything. Mr. Anderson started his Rob Anderson unfiltered webcast in March 2020. As the world was shutting down as a result of COVID-19, Prime Minister Justin Trudeau was a constant target, and Mr. Anderson declared members of the truckers' convoy heroes. His views, his views ventured into other extreme territory. In November 2020, he called for the decentralization of government power and talked about how Ottawa was using the wealth of Western provinces for its own socialist ends. He talked about taking control of police, pensions, natural resources, health care, education, and tax collection. It may mean tense times. It may mean civil disobedience were appropriate, but we have to do this. Just weeks before Mr. Kenny announced he would step down last year, an act that would set off the leadership race that Ms. Smith would win, she was still working as a radio host, a media host. Mr. Anderson was her guest on an especially long episode of her podcast, where they both enthusiastically discussed the free Alberta strategy he had co-authored. While Ms. Smith suggested she might prefer the word autonomy, neither was she totally opposed to Mr. Anderson's use of the word sovereignty. She described him as one of the smartest policy minds in Alberta. And as she signed off, Ms. Smith said she'd be in touch with him the day after Mr. Kenny's then upcoming leadership review. We'll see if we can work together on a strategy, she said. That turned out to be an understatement. Corey, do you know this guy? I don't. I don't. Um, uh, like, I know of him, and or yeah. one degree of separation from many people, but uh, no, I don't uh, I don't know him. Right. Um, it, you know, I, I agree, it's a very interesting story. You don't normally see people... Uh, have those sorts of peaks and then and and then valleys and then peaks again. Um, uh, uh, I, I think it, his effectiveness will be decided by you know whether or not he's learned from some of those those valleys. You know, I I think you you and I are are probably similar in some ways in that we've had some peaks and valleys in our career uh, as well. But you know, uh, I like to think that I learned from those mistakes and. And, uh, you know, you can't argue with success. Like uh, Smith did a course correction. Uh, I, I, you know, not intimately involved in the campaign out there, so couldn't really tell you why. But I, my guess is it's probably more about Steve Outhouse than it is about uh, this fellow. Because it doesn't sound uh, like he was the author of the of the virage that Smith took during the campaign. Yeah, well, true, yeah, like, like it's, you know, it, you know, what she did is distance herself from the Sovereignty Act. You know, it was, as we talked about, it's like everyone in Alberta was angry at the Trudeau government and, and would, you know, uh, support uh, Smith as, as the best person to defend uh, the province on every issue except one, and that's the Sovereignty Act. And then that's the one you want to put in the window. Uh, that, that screams uh, ideology over, uh, over polling uh, in terms of what's driving your decision making. Um, so, I, you know, it's, it's, it's interesting. I also think it's weird when advisors get, you know, uh, cooperate for big profiles of themselves. Uh, I think that's, that's, you know, that's always looks bad. I, I, I find it really unappealing. Uh, when people do that, but uh, you know the the person in elective office should be. I feel uh, the compelled star to the point show. out that when the Globe and Mail did a very large profile on Terry and I back in uh, 2003, she did not cooperate, but I of course did. So, <laughs> well, I, I've played along with some we of those things in the past, but I would say I would say <laughs> I would say never usually work. It usually doesn't work out very well. Um, <laughs> John Ibbotson was very gentle with me. Uh, <laughs> what do you think when you read this, Jordan? Uh, I mean, <clears throat> I was struck by the degree to which it seems like he plays a really important part in, in creating a very insular environment around uh, Premier Smith that is maybe reinforcing of some of her own worst instincts on this stuff. And, and I think... You know, I even think about um, the decision to halt the clean energy projects that, that happened over the last week that, you know, if you're a government trying to project certainty for business, that this is this is not tip top advice. But if you are operating in a bit of an echo chamber where clean energy has come to represent a certain value set, well, then it makes perfect sense. Um, but but when you step outside of that bubble, you know the majority of these projects are are actually owned by guess what oil companies. Um, so so I think I think that if you look at some of the issues that that he has most recently been championing, and and you know the article talks about this, but of course if he was authoring the mandate letters, 
And we saw the return of the Alberta pension plan, which is just, yeah. just sort of like a lethal policy for the Daniel Smith government. It is unpopular. It is unpractical. It is, um, it is exactly the type of thing um, that, that creates a massive vulnerability. And so I would look to his history as an advisor uh, and the advice that he has given to her over the years. And, and to me, the record seems maybe uh, not stellar. Um, and it's advice that maybe tends to reinforce some of her own worst instincts, which is a really dangerous type of advisor to have around you. And I think all leaders sometimes bring these people with them, and they are often a package deal, uh, as is described in in the article. Um, but it, you know, it's a challenge then I think for other advisors around that leader to to balance out that and to sort of gently separate um, the leader from from this person who is uh, reinforcing their own worst. Uh, thinking patterns. Don't you often find though, like there's there's one advisor that every leader has that uh, is uh, maybe a bit of a shit pump, has you know consistently bad ideas, totally. Totally. Uh, and <laughs> yet they they are the security blanket that that leader will turn to when everyone else around the table uh, says you know you can't do this, this is a bad idea. They can yeah. count on that one person to. Uh, to side with them and say no, this is a good idea, and they can. You yeah, know. you're a longtime friend yeah, of the Agnes. Yeah, so yeah, be fine. yeah, yeah, right, exactly, <laughs> right. But like, there, you know, I think there's often somebody who on staff, and I, I you know, and I don't want to say because I don't know him. I don't. I'm this. Please don't take this as criticism of him in in particular. I just think the observation that there are some people who, irrespective of what their track record is in terms of having suggested smart things or dumb things. Uh, are often kept around because they are more of an, uh, a mirror than a, than an advisor. And everybody likes to have, you know, at least one or two of those people around. Totally. So, you know, and, and I think so it, they, may that, be, they may be a package deal. It's just ne not necessarily a healthy relationship. That's right. It can be a little codependent. <laughs> but yeah, and then I think in that instance, you know, for sure, it's the challenge for other senior staff to find a way to buffer uh, that relationship and to, you know, perhaps create a little bit of distance, um, but also recognize that that comfort level with an advisor can be useful at different moments, right? But um, I think, it, you know, often it's not necessarily about isolating that person, but it can actually be about bringing them in and bring and mainstreaming them within other conversations happening within that team. Yeah, for sure. All right, Kelly Kreiderman, thank you for writing that. Uh, uh, giving us a lifting the veil and giving us a little bit of a peek into an important person in in Alberta politics and uh, more of that's good. Show us more behind the scenes stuff about who's influencing who in politics. Okay, so our last subject today, our last subject today is that the Prime Minister's Chief of Staff Katie Telford created uh, some waves on Twitter the other day when she retweeted an article by the guardian i think it was that said that there are zero pro choice mp's in the conservative party and she got a lot of blowback on that some from from some places that she might not have expected it she wasn't in trouble she doubled down uh in a second tweet and said listen it's a legit thing to say and i'm saying it uh listen abortion and first of all, I would say one of the reasons I'm bringing it up is that Katie tweets so infrequently that when she does, you feel compelled to parse it for meaning. Um, and so I'm doing that. Uh, abortion is a great wedge issue for the Liberal Party against the Conservatives. It's a great wedge issue because among any voter that would consider us, there's a pretty solid consensus on it. And... People seem receptive to continue to believe that the conservatives are somehow hostile or threatening to it. The environment in the United States in the last year may have put some more life into that. I don't know. don't have data on that on that myself. Um, I'm curious, though, why she would have done this now at this particular time. It seemed absent any context. Um, why do you think she reached for this tool? now Corey. well i think it's it's probably something connected to uh our earlier conversation about them their polling numbers like that they need to try to find an issue that's going to uh rally some of their support uh back to them and uh and this is uh, been a tried and true wedge issue for the liberal party uh election after election 
uh, like I think it's almost always uh, attempted to be used, if not used, you know, as a heavy part of a negative uh, ad campaign on conservatives. I just think it's a stretch. And I think, you know, the issue in question about, you know, uh, whether you're bestowing fetal rights by saying, you know, uh, murdering a pregnant woman is is worse than uh, murdering, uh, you know, somebody who isn't pregnant. And and that, that that's a slippery slope into, uh, you know, banning abor- abortions. I think only people on the fringes of, uh, of of this issue think about the world in these ways. Like I, I think you know, it's uh, the the pro life equivalent is uh, somebody saying that you know uh, we should have no abortions, even if it's uh, you know uh, incestuous rape. Like it, it's you know the, it's such an extreme ver- presentation of uh, of the position that I think what it does accomplish is it, it alienates you know seventy five percent of Canadians whose views on abortion are more nuanced. And uh, I, I don't think you, you're going to find, you'll find a lot of pro-choice uh, people in Canada. Uh, you know, it's about 60, 40, maybe a little higher. Uh, but you'll find many of those pro-choice people who will say that, you know, if you murdered a pregnant woman, that that is worse. And that in sentencing, something like that should be taken into account. And right. like I, so I, I think she's, she's trying to use this as a wedge. I think the particular... Um, you know, uh, example that she is tying the, the message to is one that that doesn't break their way the way she thinks it does. Clearly, a successful negative attack has to have the ring of truth to it. It obviously doesn't yeah. have to be true. It's an ad and blah blah blah. But it it has to have an it has to have something that gives it credibility, a hook to believe it. Right, um, Jordan. What did, what did you think about Katie's use of this particular issue? Jesus fucking Christ is what I thought when I saw the tweet, to be honest. Mm. And I think, and, and like, let me also saddle up as, as I think what, what Corey would consider a fairly extreme pro-choice advocate in Canada. And, and I think what's really important here is, you know, to, is a few things to recognize. So, you know, Canada, we, we have no, we have no laws around fetal personhood for very good reason. Uh, and, and that's because if you start to give legal rights to something that is not a person uh, that, you know, that is a slippery legal slope. So I actually, uh, you know, I would, I would push back on the idea that this legislation is, is not in some way about abortion. It's very much about abortion uh, when you start to, uh, when you start to approach it that way. And I think that, you know, the conservatives allowed an opening on this by apparently potentially whipping their caucus to all vote in favor, or perhaps they all independently voted in favor of that. We don't really know. Um, but regardless, you know, that has has created a little moment. And I think that that Telford was keen to jump on that. This is this has been an issue that the liberals return to time and time again when they are struggling and they're looking for that issue. And it does have a ring of truth because it was the last desperate card I played in we, 2006. We know <laughs> this song, you know, and and I think New Democrats get get particularly incensed when it when it gets sung because there are actual problems with access to abortion in Canada, real unsexy problems that have to do with the fact that if you live in a rural community, you may have to drive hundreds of kilometers to get an abortion or not get one at all in time. If you're in New Brunswick, it's very limited. If you're in PEI, it's still very limited. And so there are all these actual challenges at, you know, that people have when they need to access this medical service um, but what's what's happening, what the liberals like to do is kind of cherry pick these political moments to bring this issue up without actually dealing with access issues. So we saw this, uh, and I'll, I'll tell you the other two times that it's been brought up recently, was when Roe v. Wade was overturned. You had Trudeau out uh, talking about, you know, that the liberals were never going to compromise on this. And then the last time it was brought up prior to that was in the 2021 election. So Obviously, these are being selected as as politically opportune moments rather than kind of any genuine, ongoing, real, deep engagement about expanding access in Canada. So that's, I think, a lot of pro-choice advocates feel frustration that the issue is used this way, um, but but also a lot of skepticism that the Conservatives don't have uh, an anti-choice instinct uh, really fundamental in their party. And and so that's a conundrum for, for Polyev, for sure, because I think that it can be dangled out there by the liberals quite effectively. And that's why they continue to return to it. So how can Paulie have take this off the table? 
because you know in 2006 in 2006 harper had been pretty explicit about his determination that there would be no legislation brought forward but he had said that he wasn't against free votes and so i used numbers to try to convince people that there was enough people in the conservative caucus likely that they could get a free vote passed so people are you know they're they're suspicious of the conservatives on this you don't need a lot of evidence for people to think they might be they, they might uh, be wishy-washy on this. I, I remember being in the conservative war room trying to push back on that story that you were planting, David. <laughs> uh, <laughs> you, you had convinced more than one journalist, I'll tell you that. Um, <laughs> but yeah, no, I think you're right. There's, there's, always, there's always a concern around that. And that's because the, the conservative party has a greater number of people who are pro-life in it. Uh, and there's been sort of a systematic drumming out of people with that position in the Liberal Party. It used to be uh, that there were, you know, a good half dozen uh, uh, Liberal MPs participating in, in, you know, the annual pro-life march and often speaking uh, at those things. But they, those people have all been pushed out of the party over time. Um, but, the, you know, there's still a, a good chunk of the Conservative caucus that is pro-life. Um, but there are also people, including Polyev himself, who are pro-choice. And, you know, Polyev was clear during the leadership that he is pro-choice. So, yeah. you know, I think it, this is going to be a hard one for them to use effectively, probably because of, excuse me, that reason alone, that, you know, if the leader is, uh, personal opinion is that he's pro-choice, uh, then, you know, uh, do you feel comfortable about that? You know, probably more comfortable than if it was the other way. But I mean, right. on the other hand here... If, if the conservatives are, are have this piece of private members legislation, which I think we can all agree is private members legislation, not this bill specifically, is low stakes shit. And they have their caucus voting entirely for it. This is this is an own goal. Like they don't need to do that. Right. And they have created an opening for the liberals to use this as a wedge issue. So I think that one of the things that 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 Polyev can do to protect against that attack is don't vote for fetal rights legislation. Don't have a unified caucus on this stuff. Like that, that is what actually creates the opportunity for the liberals to pick it up and wave it around. Well, I'm not sure it's a mistake for them to, to, uh, to take the position that they did and that, you know, people, most, most Canadians are like, and, and David, you may have done more polling on this than, uh, than I have, but I think it's probably fair to say we've both spent a lot of a lot of hours in focus groups talking about this issue. Uh, that most Canadians' views on this stuff is a lot more nuanced than that. And you know, I would say there are people who lean pro-life and and people who lean pro-choice. But you know, there are a substantial number of uh, pro-choice people who say they don't support abortion in the third trimester. Like, yeah, but Corey, so, like you're, you know, you're it, scaring it, me because if that's how the conservatives are going to think about this issue and that they think that they can nuance their way out of this argument, I think well, that no, I'm not, I'm not saying I'm, not, I'm, that. I'm saying that most uh, I'm saying that most Canadians have nuanced views on this, they do. and I, uh, yeah, but it's hard to communicate and, nuanced and views. And they don't want yeah. the conservatives well, but, legislating on it. Uh, sure. Uh, but I, th I think this is a nuanced issue. And if I were to want to have a fight on abortion, if I were, you know, a liberal campaign manager and saying, all right, which, how are we going to approach this and what are we going to attack on? This would not be the obvious choice. Uh, I would be going after some backbenchers who said some, you know, things that nobody who's, uh, you know, pro, ch pro choice would accept as being, uh, acceptable views. Cause I'm sure those people exist within the caucus. You know, you gotta you gotta choose which which things you're gonna put in the window if you want to use this attack. And there's some that are you know that are better than others. Do you think that do you think the demise of Roe v. Wade in the states and the actions that have been taken in some states since then um, gives this a little bit more oxygen in Canada? Because you know, when I in 2004, in the middle of the campaign, I was doing focus groups and I was saying to with women and I was saying to these women. Uh, you know, Harper's not pro-choice. Harper doesn't believe in a woman's right to choose. And especially the younger women actually didn't believe me. Mm -hmm. Like, because they thought it was such a, they couldn't believe that somebody running for prime minister in 2004 would actually have that opinion. It was such a settled matter to them that the first job was to persuade them that he actually held that opinion before you could get into whether, but once they, once they believed that he did, they weren't voting for him. That is for sure. Um, and so, 
I wonder whether it's a more plausible threat now because of what's happening in the States. I think it I is. Think so. Yeah, I think so, because it's, for, you know, for so long, there was a sense that that there was a really strong bulwark of protection of abortion rights in the U.S. And, and I think that that because there's some pretty simplistic understandings of, of, of how those issues work in the two countries, even though, of course, it's very different in Canada from, from a legal perspective, that gave Canadians a, a comfort that we had a bit the same situation. But we're now seeing uh, in, in living color uh, teenagers being prosecuted for having abortions in Texas. Um, and, and we're seeing, you know, just, just absolute horror stories, uh, uh, of people going, you know, having to go to really extreme lengths to get, to get necessary healthcare. And I think it's, you know, and, and speaking, speaking as a woman, right? Like that is scary shit, right? Nobody wants to think about that coming here. And I think that also the liberals quite rightly are looking to what that issue has done for the Democrats electorally in the U S um, which, ha you know, and I think it, it far exceeded our own uh, analysis of how it would work for them. It has been very effective. And, and it's certainly very effective among women voters, which is a key demographic that the Liberals both need to keep and also motivate to come out. These are people who are maybe souring on a lot of other aspects of Justin Trudeau's government, but this is one that people feel really strongly about. So I think for all those reasons, it's a super obvious wedge issue, but I just want to throw my phone across the room when I see it brought out like this, because it is just so crass and unreflective of the actual reality that people are living. Uh, and if you were interested in truly expanding access, this is not the way to do it. That's a separate conversation. <laughs> Here we go. All right. Maybe it's time to to bring in Gordon Pinsent and uh, salute our hey yous of the, of the week. Ladies and gentlemen, please return to your seats. The hey yous are about to begin. Who wants to go first? Well, I'll take a crack at it. Um, are you going to do it in Spanish? <laughs> my Spanish is even worse than my uh, French, and that's not, <laughs> that's saying something, uh, David. Um Steve uh, Martin told I, I, me that in Spanish, every vowel is a syllable. That's how you learn Spanish. Mm -hmm. yeah. I, I'd like to uh, do one just to, to the media generally. Uh, you know, one of the big news items of the past week, and, and you know, we made an editorial choice, I, you know, not to talk about it on this podcast, is, uh, is the prime minister uh, uh, separation. And, uh, you know, I think, I think the media has done a pretty good job of not talking about that and not sensationalizing that and not making that uh, be an issue. Uh, and I think that's the right call. And I think, you know, uh, unfortunately, politics is pretty hard on marriages. Uh, you know, you see a lot of examples of that. It's, you know, but there are things that can make it worse and things that make it better. And, and uh, you know, uh, not having uh, somebody who has that happen to them or goes through that experience, to, you know, sort of dragged along with their family through the media uh is is good so you know uh hey media uh, i think you did a mostly good job covering that by not covering it excellent here, here. i agree here here jordan i'm gonna light up the liberals again sorry guys not sorry though because um last week the prime minister was in hamilton and he was talking about housing and and he was asked a question by a reporter about you know what are they going to say to all the canadians who are struggling to find housing and part of his reply was that, and I'm going to quote, housing is not a primary federal responsibility. And so while this may be true, this is exactly the problem. This is exactly the messaging problem. This is exactly the emotional connection problem that the government has been facing that they just did an entire cabinet shuffle to address. And here you have the very main messenger of the government going out and firing directly at his own foot. So I don't know what the fuck got into the prime minister's head about that. And I, and I don't know why it seems so challenging for the liberals to execute because nobody is actually suggesting that the government can single-handedly solve the housing problem. Maybe it feels like the premiers are suggesting that, but nobody's really suggesting that. All that is being required of the government is to connect with Canadians at an emotional level to have a sense of the fear and the despair and the stress that Canadians are feeling and to validate that. That is literally all that is being asked of the prime minister. And it is beyond me why he is not able to deliver that. So that is my hey you this week, which is to feel the feeling 
um, and not the technical machinery of government. Are you telling me, Jordan, are you telling me, Jordan, that when the prime minister says that housing is not his primary job, that people do not say, oh, well, then I'm sorry I asked, as you were. <laughs> They I'll instead, go see, they instead, they instead I'll go see say, Doug well, Ford. maybe I'll find somebody who yeah. fucking thinks it is their job. Right. Yes. Well, but can, can I point out the <laughs> obvious hypocrisy in, in this stuff with the federal government to say, like, they have no problem in areas of sole provincial jurisdiction like healthcare coming in and you know imposing what they want to do and and you know using money to you know in, uh, enforce the will of what they want to do on healthcare I'm not uh, even policy mad areas like I know I'm just like, mad you're, that you're, they're you're just not ha- matching ha- the feeling that's all well, that's it that's my hate one of these. <laughs> I get it. I just I find it frustrating that, that you know it, when when a government says, "Hey, we we don't mind overriding somebody else's jurisdiction," but you know not on this one. You know, I, I think it's a wrong call. They should be buying their way into this issue as well. All right, I agree. Also, sound right. advice. My hey, you, Mr. Pinson, goes out to my uh, friends uh, David Rosenberg and Jack Ben Simon of Ben Simon Burn, or as they call themselves now, Tadium, I think. Uh, and it is on the occasion of the launch of Pierre Polyev's excellent pre-writ uh, branding exercise. I want to harken back to easily the favorite ad I've ever been involved in producing. And uh, as I'm, far as I'm concerned, the best introductory ad to a leader I've seen, which was the Kathleen Wynne running ad in 2013 oh. in the lead up to the 2014 election, told everybody what they needed to know about her strong, determined smart, committed, in her own voice in that instance. Um, But in any event, uh, these ads matter. That ad was a big factor in 2014 because it shored up a lot of her a lot of her uh, key uh, personal variables that needed uh, needed buttressing. And I suspect the Polyev ad is going to be effective too if they've got the money behind it. They say three million. It's not a huge national buy, but it's a significant national buy. Likely will make a difference. All right, everybody. Thanks for watching or listening, whichever you did. I want to thank our presenting sponsor, TELUS, and our sponsor, CEN. I want to thank Corey and Jordan for showing up, and fuck Reed for not showing up. And I think we're all going to be back next week for a full complement of Curse of Politics, and we'll see you then. In the meantime, (laughs) take care of yourselves.